All right, howdy everybody. My name's Texas Toland. I'm organizing Pure Script Unscripted. This is a this is your monthly remote online meetup. Um, revived, very much inspired by um, Phil and Hardy Jones. And um, today we're going to be addressing uh, a perceived issue of Pure Script, which is it moves so quickly to, to keep up with what's happening um, with the, the, the language syntax itself. And so some of the compiler contributors will each discuss um, something that they've added this release, that some of which may be a breaking change in our next minor release, this is zero point nine. Um, and so up first, hopefully you see, hold on. Yep, is Nicholas. So Nicholas uh, implemented source maps this time around. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen. Um, he is also, uh, and very grateful, he has really like headed up all of the plugin development recently. So for Adam, and Visual Studio Code, as well as creating shared code base for this. So go ahead and say hi. Hey. How are you? Uh, good to go? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, source maps. So uh, I guess this originally came from uh, my hacking around on some PureScript project that I think was probably Helgen-based. Pure pulls in a lot of lang uh, libraries, um, and you look at the generated... Uh, JavaScript and it, it's fine. It's quite readable, but it's one massive file. Um, it's it's you know hundreds of thousands of lines long, and um, in some cases quite a lot of nesting and so on. And I, I just find myself a bit lost. Um, I find myself looking for source maps. So uh, looking here at the um, test repository I created to um, kind of try and uh, show in a small example that this uh, works to an extent. Uh, so that's something you can hopefully pull out and uh, use yourself. Um, so I'm going to grab terminal. So there is a new command line option uh, since 0.8.2 um, in PSC, which is source maps. So uh, if you enable that option um, when JavaScript files are emitted from the compiler. Um, there will be source maps along with those as well. This is Visual Studio Code I've got here. Um, I've compiled this really simple program, uh, pure script code. It doesn't do very much. Um, so you can see that in the output, uh, as well as the output JavaScript, there's a map file. So the JavaScript refers to this map, and this is uh, the source map format. Now, this is a uh, horrible format that I don't want to have to deal with. Unfortunately, we were able to use a library to do the source map generation itself. So with this, uh, I'm going to hit run. And this is running in Visual Studio Code. Um, it's running this Hello World program on Node. Uh, and I'm going to be able to just step in. And I've stepped into this pure script. So the reason I'm running this in Visual Studio Code is that this node code is kind of um, hooked up to the Visual Studio Code debugger, and it understands source maps uh, in a rudimentary way. I can't actually place breakpoints on this, um, but I can kind of step in sometimes. Uh, and you see it's stepping through pure script code. So um, that's the, the common JS module output of the PureScript compiler has a bunch of source maps with it. To see what that looks like, there's a nice um, utility, a source map visualize. So we can see that um, for, for this import statement, there's a far statement output. Um, for each of these lambdas, there's a, a function in the JavaScript um, and so on. And you can see there are some missing lines and there's, there's not that much information. So uh, this is kind of an in initial uh, version, and I'd like to kind of enhance it to um, produce a higher fidelity output, but um, yeah, that's for the future. So um, this, this example project um, is kind of set up, uh, the reason it's there really is to show a webpack setup that will allow you to actually uh, do something in the browser with these source maps. So this, to be clear, isn't using the pure script, the pers loader, the, um, the, the pure script uh, specific plugin, but uh, it's just a sort of plain webpack config that um, 
relies on you having actually built the source yourself. But with that, um, I've sort of fired up a Webpack dev server. Um, and if I load this up, I see, again, I've got a breakpoint in here. I can step into this function. It's a bit random. You see it stepping around because the map is a little bit uh, all over. But I can actually set breakpoints um, in this PureScript code. I can navigate somewhere. Uh, and I see the various, um, and the structure is a little odd, but I see the various PureScript files um, from the, the library and so on. Um, yeah, maybe you want to ask your question now. Yeah, this is, this is incredible work. And so just to clarify, like, one of the primary use cases for this is like seeing data at runtime, I think, um, without having to log. Yeah, so um, the argument in the kind of the issue for source maps was a little back and forth and why do you need this, uh, you know, well-typed code doesn't go wrong, kind of you should expect your pure script code uh, not to need to, to sort of fail at runtime. But in my experience, it's, it's not the code that's failing in terms of throwing an exception necessarily, but uh, the data doesn't have the shape I expect. I want to just set a breakpoint and inspect it um, at runtime instead of, um, yeah, logging something or, or doing something and maybe uh, using PSCI is quite hard if I've got a bunch of browser stuff going on. So two quick questions. One would be, you talked about um, refining the output, like what's involved in that? Sorry, could you say that again? Uh, you talked about future plans for this is refining the output and presumably it would integrate uh, as far as your Webpack build with um, would integrate with pulp I assume. Yeah, so um, right now, so that's two separate points really. Right now uh, you can fire off that source maps flag to pulp, run a build and get the maps in your your output folder uh, and that's fine. And then uh, Webpack can combine source maps pretty well um, and so here, well not here but uh, in this uh, this file here, you see it's it's combined that the the output is actually one huge file. It's you know it's, it's quite long and it, it's gone several steps to our original source. So two areas of improvement. One is making the maps better. So um, there's missing lines here. This this log doesn't doesn't correspond to anything. These these variables could uh, line up with something. Uh, and for more complicated programs, you'll find that the more points that you have match up. Uh, the better things are going to work out, particularly when you're some, something like setting a breakpoint. And the other side is, this is really annoying to use if you didn't want to use Webpack. Um, maybe you wanted to use Browserify, maybe you wanted to just um, combine things with PSC bundles, um, sort of help build to this file, uh, and that won't work just now. So I'm hoping it will be possible to enhance B PSC bundle to preserve source maps or to generate its own source maps that can be combined. Um, and that would, would fix a few cases, um, like the, the Webpack PureScript loader as well uses PSA bundle. It's going to be used by a few things. I'm, I'm, actually, uh, sorry to I'm actually sort of kind of hopeful that um, like in the long term, like let's say before 1.0, that we can actually just get rid of PSC bundle because the only thing it really does that isn't covered by other things like Webpack and you know Browserify or whatever is is uh, tree shaking, right? So um, I don't know. We were talking about this the other day, where um, there were some sort of newer libraries that do similar things to Webpack. I think Webpack Two is one of them, and, and Roller that was sort of better at, um, at doing tree shaking, but sort of not good enough yet. Um, but I'm kind of hopeful that you know at some point we can just get rid of it and start using something off the shelf instead of rolling our own dead code alone. Nice. Okay, well, maybe, maybe I won't put that too high up my priority list then. <laughs> yeah, I think... One more know, question I have. Have. Sorry, I'm on satellite, so I have a delay, and so I sometimes I interrupt people, and I... And, uh, but I, one question I had, and, you know, one thing that I kind of asked in the thread was, I wasn't sure, like, how well the, like, the breakpoints and stuff would work in the presence of all, like, the desugaring, and I just didn't know if, if you had messed around with that, like, like, I'd be ecstatic, you know, if it, if, like, if you could, like, put a breakpoint in, like, a monad, and, like, and how, or, like, in the, de the do desugaring and have, like, some cool breakpoints, but, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure how well that worked. 
Yeah, um, so I guess uh, in this example, there's a couple of breakpoints, and this this is a, a plain do with F, and I'm not sure if it's uh, if optimizations are enabled, it's something different. So I, I think there's quite a few cases to consider, and basically what I plan to do to make these better are take a few things that I want to work and kind of work through those and see where they're failing. Um, there's mm -hmm. kind of getting, getting the right uh, source annotations in at the start, there's uh, making sure that the various transformations don't kind of kill things. Um, op optimizations and rewriting in particular uh, could be an issue. My only other quick question is, I, I recall there's different styles of source maps, right? There's uh, inline source maps. Did you have to make a decision regarding that? Uh, no, to my recollection, I used the one that was supported. So I'm using a library called, I think, Source Map, um, a Haskell library, uh, to generate source maps, which was pretty much fine to be used as is. Uh, I, I had one one issue that I needed to s submit to them because it was really slow in, in our use case. But um, other than that, that was working as is. So the maps that we're generating are, uh, if I bring this out again, are um, not in line, but the annotation is in line. So the, there's a couple of levels of, of um, in lineness, as I understand it. Um, so the map does not include the source, the original source, um, but the reference for the map is in, inside there. Um, so you can pull in the original source into the map, and you can also pull in the map into the JavaScript file. And there are tools that will do that for you if that's what you want. I think the really cool thing about this as well was that um, uh, Nicholas managed to sort of implement it in a way that uh, is actually like zero cost for when you when you have the option disabled, right? Yeah, um, I spent quite a while with the optimizer and learning about Haskell, basically. This is basically my second uh, non-trivial uh, bit of Haskell I wrote, and I had to learn uh, how to sort of do profiling and, and all this stuff. Um, and it was quite an, uh, an experience. Well, thank you so much, Nicholas. That's really cool. All right, so up next, uh, we had some people who can be here. Um, that would be... Uh, Gary Burgess, who is one of the maintainers of PureScript. We had um, Christoph Hageman, who uh, he worked on PureScript IDE, uh, which is new in 0.8, I believe. Um, and Harry Grube, who has built a whole bunch of stuff, um, most notably for C. And so I talked to them uh, prior to the meeting and pre-recorded that. So I'll share that. Feel free to interrupt in the middle if anything needs clarified. So Gary Burgess is one of the maintainers, uh, along with Phil, of the PureScript compiler. So how did you get involved in it? Um, I kind of stumbled across it. Um, I'd been looking for something that I could use to avoid having to write JavaScript, you know, as is. Um, and I'd kind of, uh, I'd, I'd tried out Elm for a while, but um, it didn't really quite do some of the things I wanted to do. And, I, you know, I kind of missed type classes and a few other features that I'd been using in Haskell. Um, I'd previously sort of been working on my own language, uh, which was basically had the same goals as PureScript, but it, it wasn't. But it wasn't as far along, so I kind of decided I'd start contributing to that instead, as uh, it seemed to be in a better place already. Um, and also, my language had been written in Scala, and I kind of liked the idea of writing it in Haskell instead, which makes sense since it's inspired by Haskell. So. And you're actually uh, one of the fabled, you do peer script on the job. That's right, yeah. I, uh, I, I've been doing it almost full time for a year now. It's probably about a month shy of a year of full time peer scripting. So I'm feeling and rather. I forgot too, like before you had done any of that, you were writing fairly large code bases in CoffeeScript? Um, I've written a bit of CoffeeScript, yeah. I mean, there were two fairly major projects that I'd done in the past, um, but I kind of. I, I liked it at first, but the more I used it, I found a few things problematic, M mainly variable scoping, um, you know, the automatic declaration of variables sort of thing, because I had a tendency to use shadowing quite often, and then you can get some quite interesting bugs when you do things that way. Um, and uh, yeah, just some of the syntax ambiguities and things like that kind of 
you know, in the end, I decided I'd rather just use JavaScript and, and you know, you run ES hint and any kind of linting that I could possibly uh, add to kind of try and improve the safety of the code that I was writing. But really, I knew the answer was, you know, types, something more principled than uh, just a dynamic language. So, so I think for 0.8.2, you jumped on a feature. Um, just like of your own accord, it was operator aliases for data constructors, is that it? Yeah, that's right. And so the operator aliases in general was a new feature. Yeah, that came in 0.8, I think. Um, and the motivation was, you know, to kind of um, improve the JavaScript code generation so we wouldn't have these crazy looking um, mangled names for the operators where we have like dollar um hash whatever and kind of you know name listing things out as words right and very esque um, naming yeah. yeah and so that wasn't great and also we wanted to kind of um improve the ability to document the uh, operators as well so giving them giving, having to name every operator means at least there's some word you can search for in google or things like that where where you actually want to find out what something means um i mean we've got pursuit but not everyone knows about that either necessarily. So at least they can search for, you know. And then, so just to clarify, in case anyone doesn't know, the, the gist is we've always been able to define operators as functions, but now they have to alias a named function. Yeah, that's right. So, so and what happened was uh, the dot two release? So the thing that I realized when I started updating the libraries for the code changes we'd be making for uh, 0 0.8 was that, um, you couldn't actually declare the aliases for a data constructor directly. So um, you would have to kind of make a function which was just an alias for the data constructor and then make an alias for that if you actually wanted to kind of use the operator to be able to construct data, con data structures using um, an operator. But then I realized once we had the syntax in place for using the operators that way, you could also use it in patterns. So that was great because it, could, it meant we could sort of bring back some of the stuff that we'd lost in the previous release, right. where um, you could do uh, cons patterns in, you know, in binders, so you can actually destructure a list, um, not an array, but you know, lists which actually are based on a sort of cons uh, pattern. So that that was quite a nice um, kind of unintentional feature. That I mean, it ended up being a bit more work than I intended as well, but it was worth it, I think, because um, it makes for some much nicer. Uh, yeah. potential. Well, what's it look like? So the syntax for declaring them is basically the same as we have for the um, normal uh, patterns where uh, normal operators. So you you just the infi the fixity declaration is the same as it was before, except before you used to just have the name of the uh, operator, whereas now we've introduced this kind of alias part to it, where you kind of um, explain what it is you're aliasing and what it's being aliased as. So the only difference here is now that you can actually use um, proper names in here. Proper names being what we call names that start with a capital, basically. Um, so syntactically, before that was disallowed, it would have just failed to actually pass the file if it encountered one of these. So um, that's pretty straightforward. It was just a quick a change to the parser. But then what we have down here is an example of a pattern match where we are actually using this alias we've declared above to um, destructure our list where... If you don't mind me calling out because it, it really wasn't announced, what's the uh, upside down A? And okay, a this is another feature that, yeah, it's not, not related to this, but something else that went in around about 0 0.8 was um, Unicode um, uh, symbols for, for some of the kind of uh, common bits of the language. So that is a logic symbol for, for all, meaning we're just declaring A as you know, uh, being the type variable in scope for what we've got going on here. And likewise, I'm using the Unicode arrow for this and I think the Unicode uh, symbol here for types. And so, yeah, the, it's not really relevant to this example, but right. it's quite neat. <laughs> and it just might have surprised someone. Well, yeah. Just out of curiosity in terms of your workflow, how do you type those in? Um, so in this example, I copied and pasted them from somewhere else. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I haven't really figured out how I'm going to work with that stuff. Yeah, yet. I know on Mac you can have like key sequences that automatically transform. Yeah, exactly. I think that'll be the case. I'll do something like that. Or maybe I can make my um, uh, editor automatically insert them if I use, you know, certain key combinations, that kind of thing for the actual. So you were type. showing us like the, the underscore X underscore. Yes. So, so explain real quick, just in case, you know, 
uh, anyone doesn't know, that means what? So, so basically, underscore is really familiar as well. Yeah, so underscore is basically meaning we don't care about what this value is in the pattern. So we're just throwing away any information that we could get from there. And uh, what we're doing here is, I mean, this function is a bit unsafe, really. Um, but what it's essentially doing is grabbing the second item um, in an array. So get one, meaning the index one. Um, previous to this, we would have had to write something more along these lines. Um, I'm probably going to get this wrong now. Uh, So this is equivalent to the line above it, which as you can see is a little bit harder to kind of scan and work out what's going on. And, um, so that's one of the major benefits from being able to use operators for some of these things. There are types which, uh, and uh, op operations which make more sense, uh, kind of using an infix declaration rather than trying to write them as sort of a nested S expression like situation that we have here. Um, and that's about it really. I mean, the, you can use them also to construct Values yeah, as you'd expect. Like in Git, you actually use them in a parameter position versus uh, like in the body of the case. Right? Uh, so say again? In Git 2, the very next one, it's the same thing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, the only difference there is, uh, yeah, like you say, I'm using them for a, um, a declaration which isn't using a case statement, but uh, we're using patterns in yeah, the actual binder position for a function. Um, the, this is, the case expression here is actually what this will end up as in the compiler anyway. So this was more just a test that the um, parser behaves correctly and can extract them from either um, definitions of this kind or when you use it in a case. And uh, the get3 example is I declared a left infix version of the operator as well. So to get this one to behave correctly, you have to bracket it. But again, really, this is not very helpful. It's just checking that left and right fixities are behaving correctly because this is just um, a test file from the compiler as it is, rather than, I probably should have made a real example that would have been better to illustrate, but yeah. I mean, it's relatively helpful, I actually like the git one. Um, and then you were going to tell me what the, the actual main was doing. Oh, that's right, yeah. So there was just an example in here of, you can use these operators to construct values as well. So this isn't really that surprising. This, was, this is actually the use case that I was originally envisaging when, when I implemented the feature and then shortly after realized that it had a much more, you know, you know I had a second benefit to being able to use it in patterns as well. So, um, and you can mix the operators as intended. Um, so another thing with these aliases as well is the code that it generates actually uses the named um, values like this. So when you actually look at the piece of code that comes out here, we don't have um, these operators appearing in the JavaScript at all. It will actually be a construction of, or a chain of cons which have been inserted instead, which um, sometimes it, it wouldn't make the JavaScript any harder to understand than it would have otherwise have been, but it means sometimes it won't directly be one-to-one -one with exactly what you wrote here. And then it's, it's not too much of a rabbit trail. Out of curiosity, yeah. exactly. it's kind of unrelated, but like, you have operators like plus or uh, the function application that are very general. Like, how do you specialize those in the generated code? Um, so what happens is, it, it, essentially, there's a, there's a pass um, that happens before we even get to the point of um, changing. So the operators go in as, as they are, and then we just literally replace the symbols with the named version of them at a certain point. So um, we don't have any kind of clever type situations going on with what we're doing there. It's purely a case of just where we see a, a colon like this, we would replace it with cons and re-bracket the expression accordingly to match the um, fixity declaration that we have for the actual type. Sweet, awesome. And my understanding is you have one uh, more thing you want to do with operator aliases. Uh, I think for tech constructors, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So we can alias um, values of various kinds now with both data constructors and functions, but um, I'd like to extend this uh, so that we can use it in types as well. I mean, there is a slight um, risk of that being abused because you can make some very confusing type signatures <laughs> given that you can rearrange the bracketing of things and that sort of thing. And then to yeah. clarify, again, like just in case anyone's having trouble like formulating how this plays out, it's in the type signature, right? We could potentially. Yeah. Um, I'll do a little pseudocode example, actually, so I can probably illustrate that way. So, um, for instance, we at the moment we have um, 
the natural transformation um, type signature is something like this. Uh, so whenever you use this in a piece of code, you would have like um, uh, oh yeah, actually I don't need this for all that. So the implementation of this doesn't matter too much, but the point is this thing doesn't really look like a function. It, it's just, you know, it could be anything unless you happen to know that what that is what natural means. So natural, in fact, is one of the motivating cases for what, why I'd like to have this feature uh, in here. Because what we could do instead is we can alias natural as something like, uh, actually, I'm not sure exactly what the fix key would be here for this, but I can't off the top of my head, but we could do something along the lines of this. Um, and then when we write these functions, which are natural transformations, we can instead use a symbol, which at least makes them look like they're still a function. And I think th this type of situation is where these are going to shine most prominently. You know, things where we have functions that uh, it's useful to have as an alias because they have some kind of fairly complex internal structure, but we don't necessarily need to expose it. But now we can sort of preserve the effect of them looking something like a, like a function still. And likewise, um, tuples, we can perhaps make an alias for those so that you can use them more. You know, normally we have this kind of thing going on. Um, I'm not sure, exactly sure what symbol we'd want to use for this because I don't think we could use comma as an operator. But in the tuple, we've been, or you've been using caret, right? Um, or yeah. not caret, but like slash slash. Yeah. Um, and either as well would be another example. You could, you could um, um, use the kind of... Uh, this definition of either, which isn't necessarily, I would probably still use either in most cases, but sometimes if you have kind of like a, a nested bunch of either's, you could have like, you know, this kind of definition is going to look much nicer than when you've got a whole chain of either's kind of um, stuck together. And uh, that's, that, these are the real, the, the, they're kind of, this is going to be a much more less useful um, feature, I think, than say the kind of value based uh, operator aliases. But, um, it should actually help with the readability of certain types of code. So, somewhat um, aesthetic, kind of like the Unicode. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's it's just a, there are a few things that would be much nicer with it um, from yeah an aesthetic point of view and occasionally a readability point of view. But um, hopefully people won't go crazy with, crazy with them because they could also make the code much harder to read. <laughs> well, great. Thanks for your time. Um, yeah. So if you do have any questions, I'm sure like. So I uh, like a bunch of us might. So, so um, he mentioned the the tuples, right? You could use like a an operator for that. Um, is parentheses aren't uh, significant in like a type signature, right? So couldn't you use a comma for that and then just wrap the two pieces in a parenthesis, and then it would look like a, a tuple in Haskell? Did, did that make any sense? What I just said? Yeah, oh, so you're like I just mix fix thing, right? I'm sorry? That's kind of like the mix fix syntax that you have in Agda, right? Where you can, like in Agda, you'd be able to actually define the, 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 the Haskell style, so like, you know, parens with a, with a comma style mm -hmm. tuple. Um, mm -hmm. You can find that using, um, like, like you can say something like, um, you'd write something like paren underscore comma underscore right. paren and give it a fixity or something, and, and it, you know, it becomes syntax just like an infix um, mm -hmm. declaration becomes syntax. It's called mix fix operators. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know if like I don't know if we want to go all the way to mix fix or just like if we were going to do tuples, we would probably just bake it into the language, honestly, like into the syntax. But um, I, I don't know if I like that idea, but it's an option. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was just meaning like um, if you if you can define uh, an alias in a type six or. Uh, how how is it defining the natural alias instead of using the uh, the tilde arrow use a comma and then you just wrap both the arguments in parentheses right so since the parentheses aren't significant in the type signature you wouldn't actually like lose any information or gain any information but you would still have like the alias of the tuple as like you know what I mean and then you could like nest them and they'd be like you'd still be using two tuples but it would nest properly or whatever does that make sense. Yeah, I think it makes sense, but um, like most things with the syntax, like you run into problems where um, you have to decide what kind of characters you want to allow in your, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. things. Because like, you know, if you allowed a comma to be a type operator, then um, 
I mean, just off the top of my head, like something like record syntax, where you have commas in oh, record. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so that's an ambiguity now, so you have to sort of decide. Um, that, that factors into what you want your character, allowable characters to be, so it becomes, um, it becomes tricky, right? Like, I think Haskell has something like type operators can begin with a colon or something. Mm -hmm. It's a bit weird, right? Or it used to have something like, it has to be like a, like a capital symbol or something, right? Um, so it's, it's sort of tricky to pick that set, I think. I don't yeah. know what you're doing, but it's interesting. Right on, right on. So from my perspective, I like the parity between type level and value level as well. So you're saying you could special case type level, but I don't necessarily think that's a good idea. One thing I think that's neat, uh, that could be neat about like the type level ones, especially in a framework like Halogen that has a lot of like weird looking, uses a lot of weird sounding things like co-product. And you know, they're really not that complex underneath it, but it's something that looks really complex on the surface, especially when you see like big type sign signatures with like nested code products. And if you can flatten those out, especially using an operator, it's like it all of a sudden, it, it doesn't really look like this big problem anymore. Because, you know, especially when you're using like, uh, you know, flow, like the flow type system and stuff, and you can declare either, you know, kind of anonymous unions for your types. And it's, it's kind of the same idea, basically. And when you have like just the bar, just you know, each type's separated by a bar, it's you know, it's not that complex. Whereas you know, we're kind of defining like this this huge nested list, like type level list, almost almost like. And if you can flatten that out, it it becomes a little easier to understand. Cool. That's a good point. Um, all right. So up next, I think is Liam Goodacre. Are you on? Yep. Hello. Right, so share your screen if you like. So uh, <clears throat> the next feature wasn't necessarily implemented by Liam, but there was a discussion that was began by uh, Taylor Fossack, who's implementing an alternate prelude kind of for beginners, for dummies, if you will, just more experimental than anything. And uh, part of that discussion was the a trouble with operator sections. That is, like, in particular, um, what it means to have the minus partially applied uh, Liam is responsible for the proposal that resulted in Phil at the minute. So, go ahead, take it away. Okay, um, so should I give a quick overview about what operator sections are, just in case people don't know? Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about your involvement with PureScript. Oh, my involvement? Um, yeah. So, uh, my involvement is basically bug reporting and um, helping out with the libraries. I haven't actually done anything with the compiler yet, but um, I'd like to in the future. And which, which libraries? I did notice some of your contributions there. Um, I think I did some stuff with the foldable library, um, arrays, strings, maps, stuff like that. Great. So, uh, so what happened with operator sections? And yeah, go ahead and remind us what, what this means um, and then expand out maybe to like, what are use cases even beyond operators? Okay, so um, I'll get started with uh, what an operator section is. Um, so I'll use the example of a uh, list append. And so if we want to um, only apply one of the arguments to this operator, um, one way you could do that is with a lambda. For example, like this. Um, but a nice and more concise way is to use an operator section, which is essentially like this. And um, uh, what this is essentially doing is partially applying a binary operator with one of its two arguments. And this works both ways around, for example. Um, one um, problem here is that um, with uh, unary minus, and if you try and so if you if you did say zero minus, and then supplied an argument say ten, you get minus ten. However, if you try and do it the other way around, you get an error because it's treating um, minus as unary minus. So this is actually minus 10. And so um, 
my suggestion was to use an underscore. For example. Um, so as you can see, both syntaxes are still supported, so this isn't actually a breaking change. Um, and uh, that's about it, I think. Will it, so are the plans to make it a breaking change? Um, like the other form of operator section won't be allowed anymore? Uh, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, and then maybe another question is, so what happened to Midas? I remember that being a big part of the discussion. What, what will Midas ultimately mean? Um, so I don't know about future plans, but um, currently minus is still unary minus if you don't have the underscore. And then, uh, Phil, do you want to pick that one up? Sure. Uh, what was, sorry, what was the, what was the what, question? What's the future plans for this oh, right. operator section? But basically, what yes. will happen to minus 10? Um, so in, I think it's point 0.9, we're going to remove the old syntax, first of all. Um, and I point nine will probably end up um, extending this to a couple of things like uh, lambda case if you're familiar with the idea from um, from Haskell. So the idea is that um, the underscore can sort of appear in a few places syntactically and mean um, that you're sort of like abstracting. You know, you're doing a function abstraction, right? So like, right, exactly. So um, you can you can use um, an underscore to mean a section accessor, for example, so the underscore dot foo is sectioning the foo property accessor on the object, or you can use it for an update, or you can use it for a, uh, for um, record creation as well. Um, so with this now, the underscore also means that you can um, you can use it for sectioning operators, but in future we probably want to section a couple of other things, so maybe uh, sectioning case, um, which is equivalent to Haskell's lambda case, and there's probably one other thing. Um, it's, it's on the issue, but I forget exactly what it was, but um, the, the nice thing about this, though, from like a compiler implementation point of view, is that um, up until now, the, the underscore is treated sort of um, quite speci specially in the compiler, in the, in the parser. Um, and it was, um, we used the, the underscore lexeme in a couple of places, um, and it wasn't sort of shared, right? So uh, there's actually uh, syntactic ambiguities in the grammar right now because of that. But um, because it's becoming so common and we're using it in so many places, um, we can actually uh, we can apply this transformation sort of like during the desugaring phase instead, which means that um, the the parser like there's far less ambiguity in the parser around underscores, which means that the error messages from like bad syntax become a lot better because um, the, the, you know because there's fewer ambiguities exactly. So um, so you know this is sort of one, once we remove the old. Uh, some of the old um, syntax, uh, we should hopefully start getting nicer errors in the parser as well, which is, which is quite nice. Great. And then just to be clear, for any if, if it didn't uh, make sense to anyone's understand the case, like, ultimately what it'll mean is instead of have a, a lambda say like uh, slash x arrow case x, we'll just be able to say case underscore without um, creating an anonymous closure around that. Oh, the other thing, like, regarding like the future of this, I guess, is um, sort of what I don't want to do in the future, which is, um, if you're familiar with Scala at all, Scala has something quite like this, which is, um, I think you can put an underscore pretty much anywhere an expression is, is allowed. Um, and it will sort of, it applies some rules that I don't actually fully understand to determine where the function binder, where the function abstraction should go, and it sort of like picks the sort of smallest enclosing expression that makes sense or something. Um, so I don't want to go down that right, right? There's a couple of examples of like usually atomic things like accesses and um, like non like non terminals essentially um, that that it makes sense to to allow the underscore, but I, I don't want to go all the like you know the full scale away and, and allow underscores everywhere. So I, think I need to like, clarify, yeah, the difference from scale away. So in for what we're doing, we're basically throwing information away when we use underscore. Scala is quite different. Scala uses underscore to essentially anonymize information. Um, so underscore plus underscore would be a lambda that adds the first thing to the second thing. And right. underscores are positional, like that. so that's not what we're doing at all. Right. Great. Well, thanks, Liam. Um, next up, uh, uh, Christoph Hegenen, um dropped in.
uh, on video from Munich. He couldn't be here today uh, to show us PSC IDE, um, which is how the editors communicate with Pure Script Compiler. Um, so I will fire the rest off. Hegeman? I don't think I got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, you, you work on a Pure Script IDE, like the part that actually drives the editors. Um, what else is your involvement in PureScript? Um, so I've, I've got started with PureScript uh, looking at the talk that Odil gave at StrangeLib, I think. Okay, awesome. Um, and from there on out, I, I, I used it to build a little timetable app, and I've been uh, amazed by the language ever since. And, yeah, and more recently, I started getting into, into reading the compiler or working with PureScript IDE. Yeah. So how did you even like think of starting on PureScript ID? Yeah, so really I was I was uh just I was bored. <laughs> I just wanted to kill some time, was looking for for a side project I could work on. And so I started at the beginning of September 2015. So it's not not that long that I've been working yeah. on it. So we just had a new release, 0.8.2. Um, and there were some big changes both for the compiler and for the IDE component. Like, what was that? Because the IDE was a standalone tool, right? Exactly. It was uh, initially it was a tool that I developed myself, uh, like separately from the compiler. And, um, and was it in Pure Script or Haskell? It's a, it's written in Haskell okay. uh, because it uses the compiler as a library to provide some of its functionality, like the parsing. There's no point in reinventing all that. And this kind of this created dependency issues where if you if you'd use the wrong compiler version, um, you'd need to keep them in sync basically. Right. And so that's the motivation for bundling it with the compiler because it eases uh, deployment. Let's see. Um, it, can you show me kind of like how it works? Maybe like so. It's there's two two parts of it, right? Yeah. The client and the server. Yeah, well, the, the client really is just a very thin, thin wrapper around a network socket. So, for example, the Atom plugin doesn't even use the client anymore. It just talks over a socket with oh. no. Yeah. So, but the, the, the real, like the, the real um, meat to the project is the, the server bit. So it's run as a server that you can then uh, query. So okay. I guess I could share my screen and show yeah, you. Yeah, please. Perfect. Okay, yeah. So, so exactly. So it's run as a server that can be queried. So I'm in a pure script um, project right here, and I'm going to run the server with a debug flag so that we can get some output. So now it's running, and inside the editor, I can open up a file, and I can load a module. And so now, if we look over here, um, here's the load. Mod, uh, command so it communicates via JSON. And then we can see that it loaded up the module demo, data array, and data list. Right. So the server does now. I'm oh, sorry. Does now have uh, definitions for these for these modules. Right. So if we now go ahead and. By the way, that's a really wild font. I think I saw that on Twitter. <laughs> Sorry, what the the, the font? Yeah, it's awesome. Right? It's awesome, right? I love it. So right now, so now if I type fill, it's going to give me filter and filter and it's a little hard to see, but there's data array uh, at the end of that completion, so it shows me the module, and it usually shows the type in the bottom. You can see it pop up really quickly. There's a bug right now, but we're going to fix it. All right, so I can complete stuff, and now I can ask for the type in the bottom. Line, you can see that I've asked for the type of filter. Oh, right, yeah, in the status, right? Exactly, that down there in the, I think it's called mini buffer, I don't even know. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can ask for types, uh, you can get completions. Um, let's see, what else is there? Now, that's, that's only for top level identifiers, or can that, does that work for expressions, or is expressions on the roadmap? Uh, exp expressions is something that's on the roadmap, right? It, right now, it uses the extrins files that the compiler generates as intern, like uh, intermediate representations for compiling, basically. 
And that means it only has the exported identifiers as well. So you can't okay. uh, you can't get at things that are not exported from a module. Okay, so I just I just re uh, saved the file, so it got recompiled, right? Uh, I've got a watch task of help running at the side. Now, if we look at this, it watched the file and reloaded it, so that's quite handy. So it, uh, it just realized that there might have been changes to the demo module, and so it reloaded it. Okay. What um, so what all functionality does the server provide? Like it, it provides uh, completion, so it looks like some kind of matching. Like how does that work? And like it provides. Oh, I see right there. So type yeah. lookup. Yeah, exactly. So so you can ask for the type of identifiers. Um, the auto completion right now uses prefix matching. So, um, so if I go over here and I do like the filter one, right? It does prefix matching. What other? I think cons is a thing, right? Concat map, right? So if I write con, I get these identifiers. But there also is a matcher that does flex matching. Um, so you can type something like. C O and then capital M to get concat map. And is that uh, is that on the roadmap or is that implemented? That's actually that's implemented. Oh, okay. um, it, it causes a little bit of trouble because it's implemented using regexes. So, and if the identifier contained a star, for example, it would it would crash. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> for now, but that, that that that's going to be fixed soonish. Right. Okay. Okay, so that's one thing. Then the editor plugins, like you can scope the completion. So if I type L dot, you can see that uh, data list is imported qualified. I can now browse the data list module. All right, so that's all the all the functions in there. So you can filter on on the modules that you want to see. Um, what else? That was the qualified lookup, right? And then there is some functionality that is that it provides already that is not in the available in the editor plugins yet. So if I import data, maybe here, right? I could um, I could just let's say I wanted to define a function that operates on uh, for all a maybe a. I don't know, maybe maybe an array of A. So this is somewhat like a maybe to list function, probably. And now what I can do is I can I've got a binding set up for that so that it inserts a template that I can now fill out. Right, so and now I've got a a maybe over here. And now I can ask it to split on that. So I type in maybe A. And OK, that didn't work. Uh, so I type in maybe A. And now it worked. And now you can see that it expanded the possible pattern matches that you can do for a maybe. So is this inspired by Idris? Or, yes, uh, absolutely. Okay. That's, that's why I've got the inspiration for that. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's awesome. So for nothing, that would probably be this. And for A, that would be A, right? And that compiled. Great. And now we can ask for the type of F, say, if we want it. Right? And it's going to say for all A, maybe a, a, a array A in the bottom. So that works as well. So what all do the templates work for? I assume it works for, obviously, like functions with any number of uh, you know, parameters, I guess. Um, yeah. Some types. And <laughs> so, like, if I do this and I type F seven, yeah, uh, I get, I get two, two placeholders basically. Very cool. Um, yes. So this is kind of like a divide and conquer strategy for implementation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it, it does give type information for all the placeholders, but it's very verbose if I turn that on in here. But editors could use that information to provide contextual completions or something like that. Um, the general idea for PSC IDE is that it is structured more as a library that can then be used by the editor. 
Awesome. Right. So what else is on that list? Okay, let's see. So that was the Emacs plugin. Um, I'm using Emacs most of the time. That's why I showed that. The more, I'd say, developed plugin is probably the Atom plugin, uh, written by, oh yeah, I should, I should pop that up, Ben Wolferson. He also wrote the Visual Studio Code um, plugin. But I think uh, the Atom plugin, at least, is written in PureScript. So that's pretty cool. And now, if we load that up, that, that same file up in the Atom plugin, it can reuse the server that we started. And it has type information on hover. So that's pretty cool, I think. All right, so if I'm browsing this module, I can just hover over uh, different identifiers, and I get type information for that. And then used inside the function bodies as well, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's cool. No, I can't, I, uh, but I cannot select right. something. Right, not in that's, that's something that's on the, on the roadmap, though. I'm right. looking to implement that. Now, what my, have I my general understanding is you'd have to, to thread the type information through kind of like we do for source maps, right? Um, yeah, the, the source maps tracks like the positions through the type checker. I would. I was looking to do something like PSC, uh, like PSCI maybe, and like add all the let bindings to the to the environment, and then just let the type checker run against them. But I'm I'm not. I might I might be able to reuse PSCI for that actually. And then so the Atom plugin also has what it automatically brings in imports for. Um, that, that's, <laughs> it doesn't do that yet, but it can use the information that it gets from the compiler for, say, this graphics drawing import is unqualified, is not explicit right now, so I can ask it to make that explicit and it's going to um, yeah, insert, insert the, the proper, proper thingy. And then I guess, kind of unrelated to the ID, you can do a pursuit search already. Yeah, that's actually that's another thing that PSC ID provides. So if I do, if I go over here and I'm looking for the fold pass function, I can search for that, and uh, we can see that both Flare as well as Signal provide that function actually. And it's also telling you what package you have to look for. That's quite handy. That's awesome. So. What uh? What's next? Like what? Like what's your next couple of features that you're focusing on? Yes. Let's see. Oh, there's one more thing I could see. One one more thing that is implemented, but that is not in the in the editors yet. I can show you that because that's pretty cool. I think uh, because PCID can show typos like Elm does. It uses the same algorithm as Elm does. So if I go into the I'll main over here. This is not in the editors yet, so I need to copy the command by hand, basically. So, um, okay, let's open up a new shell really quickly. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the client by hand. And now that uh, waits, is waiting for me to provide a command. So I've got that set up. And now if I ask for that, um, uh, I was searching for dilter M. So that's like a typo for filter M, right? And I told it to use a maximum distance of three. And now it suggests maybe you meant filter M. Maybe you meant uh, filter M from data array. Maybe you meant filter M from data list. Maybe you meant filter from list or signal. And so. When you say it uses the same algorithm as Elm, is it a dependent Haskell package, or is it actually like implemented from scratch? Um, no, it's, it, you can just import it. It's called Levenstein distance, which is like edit distance. So, how many keystrokes do I need to make to change to to turn the typo into the to the thing, basically? Very cool. That's awesome. So that could be used in a let's say project like. JavaScript PSA to enhance certain error messages. Like, like are you personally like working on the Emacs editor as well, or who's helping with that? Um, yes, I'm doing. Um, I'm doing some for the Emacs. My email list is not all that good, so I 
a lot of the stuff, uh, the, the initial project has been done by Eric Post. He's since then stepped back from development a bit, and he has, has more like merged the pull request and can um, like organize the thing a bit. Then we had Deboshenko and B Sermons both uh, uh, step in and write a lot of code. And I've done I've written some ELS for myself, but I'm not good. for the features that are not in the official plugin yet. Um, I've got the fork going on, which has some of the more I'd say experimental features. So. For someone who wants to use that, he can he can get that from my GitHub, uh, which will be here. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm six commands in front of the master. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, and what does the feature hold? Yeah, let's let's look at the feature. Okay, so there's two things that uh, I want to f um, name explicitly. For one, there's a fast turnaround that we get with Trad Script, for example, like the the online the online PureScript editor. Uh, you've seen that. And and this, is, uh, this is currently an open issue in the repo, right? Exactly. And I think that could be in scope for PSCIDE because it's explicitly tailored at providing faster error messages for editors. Um, and then the other thing is type info for the intermediate. Oh, and just for the benefit, because like not everyone's reading the issue, yeah. um, try peer script is somehow keeping uh, data in memory, right? The externs. Uh, exactly. Instead of like having to deal with IO and mm -hmm. is able to provide feedback faster. Exactly. So there's like, there's like this data structure where all the names and types for these names are, are put in. And if you just hold that in memory, it's, it's a lot faster than having to re-parse uh, all this information. Does that... I mean, does that make PSC persistent? I th I th I'm, not, I'm not sure if you... Actually, I, it might even break consistency because of some transitive export um, dependency thingy. But not being 100% consistent is all right in an editor, um, in an editor environment where it's more important to be, be fast. Because if you have to wait for your editor, you're not going to enjoy developing at all. Right. So, and then the type info, like what kind of intermediate expressions are you looking forward to providing? Yeah. So, if you take something like, say, this fold P thingy, that if I, if I select all of that and ask for the type of it, I'd like that to tell me what type of signal I get back from this. Right. So fault P has a signature, you can see that down there, right? And I'd like to, after I applied step initial state and inputs to that function, I'd like to know what signal, what B is after applying all of these arguments, basically. And would you be able to select like, say like, uh, just for full P step and know yeah. what? Exactly. And that would give me that would then give me a function that takes still takes two arguments, right? So it would only apply the B, no, the function A B B, right? Exactly. Right. Wow. And you can do that today if you ask PSCI, right? Right. I just think that was really cool. Yeah. No, it's amazing. I do have one question for Nick. I wonder if he knows it. Is go to on the roadmap? Does the does the server provide that capability now? Um, what would need to be in place? Nicholas. I've not looked at that in detail. Right now, you can do C tags um, if you get uh, PSC docs to output C tags. I've never actually used that or missed it enough to bother to look into it. Um, I've been told it's somewhat rudimentary and annoying. Um, don't know. Okay. Yeah, I've managed to get tags working in like a uh, single module in Vim, um, not across modules. So I don't know um, like how difficult that would be. Okay. But, um, so I guess that's, is that somewhat dependent on you? Is it kind of separate from PSC server? Um, yeah. So, it, I mean, I think ultimately that's the sort of thing that we would probably want to put into PSCID because it's of the, I mean, PSCID is, 
it's it's the, it's, it's the server that like it, it sits and it keeps things in memory and, and quickly responds to queries like uh, I want to know this thing about my code. Give me you know some JSON data back that answers that query. Um, so tags is a way of solving the go-to problem, but it's specific and your editor needs to know about tags and, you know, maybe a lot do, but um, we have sort of a generic, you know, answer to these query response type of things. Um, so it sort of makes sense for the MPSC, PSC ID, I think. And the data's already all there, so it's just a case of hooking up the, you know, wiring it up. Although that's trivial or anything, but, um, you know, we have the data that we need, so. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's kind of consistent with what other language um, sort of, uh, editor services do as well, I think. Right. Makes sense. <clears throat> so, and Phil, would also, would you like to chime in on, uh, so one of the things that you mentioned is um, the possibility of maintaining externs in memory. I, I see that as an open ticket, I think, for point there. Yeah, so um, that's the approach that, like, try pure scripts and, you know, try Flare and try Thermite and all these websites use. Um, so the, the server runs, uh, and, and basically it, it, it runs in the context of a single file. So you have the file you're working on. Um, so obviously, you know, this. I'll, I'll actually show this because I'm going to use TriPureScript for my demo. Um, you have your file loaded in into the editor, and then all of the dependencies of that, all the module dependencies of that file have their externs pre-compiled and kept in memory. Um, so the assumption is that you're not going to go and change those in some separate editor tab or something, which for you know, most workflows is, is probably reasonable. Um, and then quite a large part of the, the recompile is um, passing all of the modules to make sure nothing, you know, to get the module dependencies and then make sure that those modules didn't change on disk. Um, and we can skip and, and then, you know, getting the types out of the externs file so that we can type check things which depend on them. And we can skip all of that stuff if we have all that ready loaded in memory. So all that we need to do when we compile that one file is pass it type check it against the stuff we already have in memory and it just becomes much faster. So um, really? that PSCI ID server will provide a query that basically says build this module relative to the externs you already have loaded. Um, and you know, you'll get the same sort of experience but in like any editor that has support for PSC ID. Well, you're up next. Uh, so Phil Freeman, the creator of PeerScript, talking about um, what? Oh, deriving. Uh, it's supposed to be demoing uh, eek and odd deriving. So uh, I updated TriPureScript to, to actually um, allow me to give a demo of this. Um, so the, the algebraic data types file here has, uh, I've just extended this to, uh, to give a quick demo. So um, eek, this one, and, and odd are two type classes that are uh, defined in the prelude. So eek is a type class that gives you uh, decidable quality checks. So given two values, uh, test whether they're equal or not equal. Um, and odd is a type class that gives us uh, comparisons. So given two values, tell me whether the first one is less than, uh, greater than, or equal to the other one. Um, so pr prior to 0.8.2, um, if you wanted to use these instances, you had to write out instances by hand. Um, and they're quite cumbersome to write out if you have a lot of things in your, a lot of uh, arguments in your data type, or if you have a lot of constructors to your data type, especially odd. Um, so as of this release, you can actually just use the derive syntax to derive both of these instances. So um, I have this, this name type here. So it consists of a first name and a last name. Um, and I'm just deriving the eek and odd instances. Um, and because I have an odd instance for, for name, I can do things like use it as the um, use it as the key type in a map or a set. Um, so I have a phone book here, which is a map from name uh, name values to strings, which can be the phone numbers. Um, and here's my map. So I, I, you can see I'm using this this John Smith name here um, as the key in the singleton map. Um, and then main is just looking up that name inside the phone book and printing it out, so you can see the response here. Okay. Um, so if I change this, for example, you know, this becomes nothing. Uh, and this is that, that live reloading thing that I was talking about. This is the, the keeping extends in memory. Uh, so this is the sort of, you know, speed of response you can expect in the editor as soon as we, um, add that, that sort of functionality into PSD. And so regarding the implementation, I have a couple questions. The first would be, so are you actually generating instances for these or are you using the underlying instance? 
No, no, I'm, I, we, I, I was actually going to show the code because it's sort of 50 lines. It's actually um, quite pleasant Haskell code, uh, I think. So uh, I, I'll show you like exactly how, how this gets derived. But um, basically, we, yeah, we create an instance and it, it, the instance just um, gets derived by sort of um, induction over the structure of all the types, if you like. So for the, for the eek case, we're going to take all of the, uh, the, the arguments to the constructor and we're going to pair them up. So we're going to, going to have two of these things. So we're going to have two first strings, and they better be equal, uh, and two second strings, and they're going to be equal too. Um, and for the compare case, we're first going to compare the first two strings, um, and we're going to basically do lexicographical ordering. So we're going to compare the first two, and then if necessary, compare the second two. Um, and that's how the, these things are uh, derived. Um, but you can derive instances when, um, you know, for any... Uh, any sort of standard types made up of things in, in the prim module, essentially. So uh, strings, integers, booleans, uh, characters, um, numbers, arrays, records uh, can all be um, can all be derived. And then any data types that already happen to have an econode instance uh, can also be derived. So, um, so as, an, as a quick example, like for example, if I want to allow uh, one first name and uh, you know, multiple other names. So this is kind of like a non-empty list, if you like. Um, so this person might be John Q. Smith. Uh, so I can also derive um, an instance for uh, for this type. So it's, it's doing um, recursion on the structure of this type here where, you know, uh, I know how to compare strings. And if I know how to compare strings, I know how to compare arrays of strings. Um, so I can build an odd instance for this whole thing. That makes sense? Yeah, brilliant. So I guess like new types would be a special case. Is that on the roadmap? Yeah, so um, new types are slightly different because um, what, what I want to happen is, uh, let's say, I want to make a new type for, um, for email addresses or something, right? Um, I should be able to derive so I, I can derive, um, let's say, eek email, right? So I derive instance. Um, so this is already possible. Um, but because this is a new type, really I should be able to derive any instance that string already has, right? So uh, I don't know, what's an example? Um, I don't know, show, for example, right? Uh, you can't derive show right now, but you can show a string. Um, so I should be able to show an email. And uh, what I'm hoping to add at some point is uh, new type instances. So if you're familiar with um, generalized new type deriving in Haskell, uh, it's basically going to be uh, the same um, minus the sort of complications that you get uh, with uh, type families and, and you know role, uh, roles in Haskell and that kind of stuff, because we don't have those type system features. Um, so you're going to basically write something like this, and it's going to uh, allow you to reuse the show instance for string uh, as a show instance for email. And that's safe because email is actually just isomorphic to string because it's a new type. So you could actually just take the dictionary at runtime and just treat it like it was the dictionary of the email type. If that makes sense. Yeah. So essentially this is going to be like unsafe coerce at runtime. And then you're planning that, I guess, for any type class, right? Yeah, exactly. So where this is really useful, um, if you're familiar with the transformers library, uh, so you could say something like, I want my, my app monad. If I want to create a, a monad transformer to deal with all the effects, right? So uh, that I want in my app. Maybe I want uh, state, uh, have some state, and uh, I want errors. So we'll use accept my error A, right? Um, so now I can just start deriving uh, all the instances I need to actually work with this thing, right? So um, now I can derive things like monad, my app type, or I could uh, even you know, something like monad state, right? because um, state T is a monad state. So now app is a monad state. So this means I get all of these operations for free on my app monad, um, but I don't have to actually uh, expose the internals um, my, my exports list would just look like I export the type constructor, but maybe not the data constructor, right? So the, the actual fact that this is a state monad uh, and an accept monad under the under the hood is unimportant, right? This is the 
this is the actual interface that I'm going to export here to my module. Um, and it just allows you to build those things up. This is sort of a common, common pattern if you use transformers quite a bit. Um, it makes this sort of pattern a little bit easier. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Um, so the last thing we have is uh, Harry Garud popped in earlier. Um, and I pre-recorded a session talking about changes to Pursuit for this release. Um, if you're not familiar with Pursuit, it's a bit like Hugo. It's actually uh, shares Hugo's backend. Okay. Harry Garud, did I say your name right? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. And so what's your involvement with PeerScript? So I came across it uh, maybe one and a half, two years ago. Um, I was already uh, sort of involved in Haskell. I hadn't, I hadn't done anything really serious in Haskell by that point, but I had uh, uh, learned it. I was like at a sort of uh, intermediate stage, I think. So I was, I was comfortable. I was, I was at the stage where I was like choosing Haskell over. Um, uh, yeah, it was my first choice really at that point. So, so I was really comfortable with like types and FP and stuff. Um, and I wanted to, uh, yeah, have that in the web basically. Right. Uh, I want to be able to make stuff and share it with people and um, for it to be super easy and, and the web is great for that, I think. So, and so you kind of got started with your big contributions at the last GSOC, right? Yeah. Uh, you go center code, like how do you get involved with that? Um, so the, the first thing I did in PureScript was this multiplayer Pac-Man game. And as I was making it, I sort of kept notes about the, the things that I found difficult or confusing as it was that that was the first sort of thing I did in PureScript. And so I was hoping that that would be useful to keep if, uh, you know, we, someone was going to fix these things. Um, it's easy to forget what is difficult or confusing for beginners once you've been working in a particular ecosystem for a while, I think. Uh, definitely, I've reached that stage now with PureScript. Um, so, yeah, so after I got this multiplayer pattern game to like a playable state, I started contributing. Um, I started doing some of the things that I sort of uh, thought this would be nice if this was this way while I was making it in the first place. And that turned out to be quite a lot of fun, so I kept doing it. Um, by the time uh, Google Summer of Code, like applications, like uh, they started, yeah, by the time it was time to apply for Google Summer of Code, I was already, um, I'd already made quite a few contributions. I think, I think it was to Pursuit at that time, which was very different to the one we have now. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if, if you're familiar with it. Uh, yeah, uh, our, uh, documentation website, right? Um, yeah, so it was, actually I can't remember how it was before, it was, I think it was just a single page, it was all, all static actually, I think it was based on GitHub pages, um, there was a lot less, obviously there was a lot less code at, at that time, um, so it was feasible to, I, I think what happened was there was a script that was like grab a bunch of libraries off GitHub, run a Haskell program that was based on the compiler that would pass them all and collect that information and then just jump into a JSON file that became part of this static website and say, so, yeah, anyway. And so for 0 0.8, you built Pursuit. It, it looks like you uh, integrated with Google somehow, right? Or is yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so, well, that, that was uh, before 0 0.8, actually. That was, uh, oh, wish. There was some point in the middle of, 0 0.7. Okay. Uh, I think it was August last year that we actually deployed it properly for the first time. Um, people started using it. Um, yeah, Hoogle. So Hoogle uh, has a library interface. You can, uh, as, as well as, well, yeah, yeah, you can, it, it's on Hackage, so you can say, uh, you can just declare it like a dependency, like any other dependency in a Haskell project. Uh, and it has a uh, you know, functions to create a database and query a database. So, so that was all I needed, basically. Uh, because it, the, the version of Google that Pursuit was built with, which is four, there's currently five, which is in development, um, which uh, has some quite exciting looking stuff, but it's not ready yet. So yeah, we're on four at the moment. And it assumes it only deals with Haskell, really. 
the rest so we have to do a, a few slightly hacky things to get that to work like we uh, screw around with rows like the row types because obviously well they aren't a thing in high school um, and so that's a bit yeah so we sort of pretend that pure script is high school which is a bit hacky but it mostly works that's great. What can you uh, can you show me and then like walk me through what you did with this last release in zero point eight? Right. Yeah. Uh, flash point one. We had a funny kind of dot there. Right. Let me just. So I think. Uh, well, I'm going to have to check the the release notes for Pure Script Week actually. Okay. So so first there was the big one is um, re-exports. So seriously. Yeah. That was that was 080 apparently. Right. Um. If you, yeah, if you re-export types or functions from other modules previously, because you would just completely ignore that, uh, which is not ideal. So there are some libraries that uh, that was quite a big problem for. I think Lens is one one example. Um, show me Lens and Pursuit re-exports. Yeah, cool. Uh, so and then what you just showed us was kind of like the the Hugo integration is what the search uses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so this bit here uh, was actually written manually by uh, whoever wrote uh, created this library. Okay. Um, yeah, and those those links presumably work on GitHub, but they don't here. So right. that's not ideal. Um, yeah, and so as of 080, we uh, the the tool that you would run to generate the uh, file that gets uploaded to Pursuit includes that information. We haven't actually started using it yet. So we have that information there. So it's all ready to, uh, to be used, but we haven't started actually doing that yet. Interesting. And then for 0.8.2, you did some interesting type inference. That you, uh, you made some changes to the compiler as well. Um, well, actually, this, this one, the including re-exports, that, that was all in the compiler too. OK. Uh, by the way, I, you didn't say like so uh, for everyone watching. Mm -hmm. uh, Harry's involvement with PeerScript. You're the third like leading contributor, like after Phil and Gary, um, as well as you wrote you rewrote Pulp in PeerScript. Um, you've made significant contributions to all the Node libraries. So like you've had your hands in a lot of pieces. It's pretty cool um, and very helpful on the GitHub issues for anyone who has questions. So. Thanks. Yeah. So type inference. Do you, do you know what right. yeah. that changed? OK, yeah. So uh, the compiler has been able to infer types for, for quite a while. That, um, but what, what's new is that um, these, these tools that generate documentation weren't able to. So that's BSC docs, which uh, generates markdown versions of your documentation. Okay. So I can show you a quick example of what that looks like. Um, so, oh, it's not there anymore. Hmm. But we'll still have it. This one has it. So what uh, you've, uh, lots of PS script packages have this docs directory with markdown in. And this is generated by this program called PSD docs. Okay. Um, that's probably going away soon, actually, because Pursuit is generally better. But it, it does sort of illustrate yeah, I have to admit, it can actually happening. Okay. I can accidentally click the links to GitHub sometimes instead of the links into the pursuit. Yeah, that, that is something that uh, I feel that could be improved, but it's not quite clear to me how. Yeah. Um, and so this, this text, in case it's not clear to anyone um, who, who might see this, comes from inside the source files. So you have, there's this uh, syntax for saying this is. Uh, this is part of the documentation. This text should appear in the documentation. And so I'll just find an example of that. So here um, it, it comes above it comes above the uh, function declaration or data declaration or whatever. Yeah. With a pipe character before it. So if you if you miss out that pipe, then it's just a normal comment and it doesn't come through. Yeah. And yeah, so as well as PSD docs, there's a very similar tool called PSD publish, which instead of producing markdown, it produces just JSON, which then gets uploaded to Pursuit. Uh, and so both of these tools, because they're, they're very similar, they both have the same problem, which was they relied on these explicit type declarations. Right. So it would, they would literally just parse the code and then 
take this out of the AST. And the problem with that is that if you miss it off, which is perfectly legal, like uh, that's the, the compiler is fine with that. But if you miss it off, then these tools that generate the documentation information can't deal with that. And so what they used to do was just ignore it completely, which obviously is not ideal. Um, ignore the entire identifier. Yeah. Okay. So if I, so if you just, uh, so if this line on, with the with the type signature just if if that was removed, then replicate M would disappear completely from the docs. Sure. Uh, so that's not ideal, obviously. Um, in in that change that I did for the module re-exports, it happened to um, change that behavior slightly. So before it just got ignored. Um, after that change, as of 080, it actually became it caused an internal compiler error, which so the compiler would just or the, the program PSC docs or PSC publish would just die halfway through with a not very helpful message. So that was not ideal. Um, and so there, there were two ways of fixing that: either uh, sort of handle that situation and make it go back to the old behavior, or start inferring the types, which is something that I had been meaning to do for quite a while actually. Um, so I just went for the latter. And so now, um, if you miss that line off, it will uh, it will be there, and it will use an inferred type. Right. Was there any library that you're aware of that was particularly impacted by? Um, there actually aren't that many that rely on uh, that rely on this. There aren't there aren't very many that don't use explicit type declaration. Presumably because of the convention of typing your exports. I think so. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason I know that is that another thing that happened in OAT was that we changed the format of the JSON slightly. Uh, there's, I posted about this on the on the subreddit. I was in the middle of a PHP project right now. <laughs> uh, that was it. Here it is. Um, because the JSON formats changed slightly, I tried to just regenerate and re-upload everything. And I discovered this internal compiler error bug while I was doing it. Um, but actually, yeah, yeah, there, there weren't very many. So that's good. Uh, incremental, this is an incremental DOM library. So I think, I, I don't exactly what that does actually. And there was this, this simple request one and WebGL. So yeah, they're all back up now, which is nice. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna give some quick, re uh, quick announcements before we stop recording. Um, and then y'all are welcome to hang out and chat. Uh, I'll Hang out, the video room will be here. Um, the next Pure Script Unscripted will be in April. Um, and so it will be, how does it even work? It's the second Saturday in April. I'm Alex, do I know his last name? Eddie Mingoya uh, will present, be presenting Pure Script Pucks. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, like I know Rob has used it, which is pretty rad. Um, Pure Script Pucks is like a Elm architecture like library. Something I love about the PeerScript ecosystem is that we're not locked down to one architecture, one choice. Um, we can delegate to JavaScript frameworks. Um, as you can see with Thermite, we are delegating to React. With, uh, with Halogen, we're, we're delegating, I believe, to Vida. Um And Pox is using uh, FRP like architecture on top of React as well, which, which opens up that ecosystem to you, and he's going to be presenting both um, on, on use cases and getting started with it, and maybe just a little bit about the architecture, how it's built. Uh, every fourth Saturday of the month, we are starting what is called PureScript Hacked. And so show up. Uh, there's very little structure, just you show up and code. You can share your screen if you want to. Um, I will split people up to, to code in kind of separate presentations, um, depending on your interest. Uh, so there we have it. Um, that concludes peer script and scripts. Did I miss any questions for uh, pursuit? Um, I kind of breeze past that. I think it was all pretty clear. Great. Okay, so feel free to hang out. Recording is done.